should be live on Facebook now. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for attending the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion's Lunch and Learn. March 31st is International Transgender Day of Visibility, excuse me, Visibility, in which we celebrate the accomplishments of transgender and gender nonconforming people while raising awareness of the work that still needs to be done to achieve trans justice. I would like to thank Commissioner John O'Grady, Commissioner Kevin Boyce, and Commissioner Erica Crawley for their continuous support. I would also like to thank our County Administrator, Kenneth Wilson, who is in attendance with us today. Administrator Wilson, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Leandra. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Jerron Terry, Volunteer President of PFLAG Columbus and Chris Hill, Secretary of PFLAG Columbus. Jerron is an Ohio native, US veteran, and is a local public relations and communications practitioner. Uh, she is also an adjunct uh, professor at Franklin University where she teaches crisis communications and creative thinking. Jerron is an advocate for social justice and human rights and uses her voice for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Chris is on the board of directors in addition to being secretary of PFLAG of Columbus and is passionate about creating a more loving world for the LBGTQIA plus community. Uh, she is a proud mother of three sons, one of which identifies as transgender. Chris is also a yoga teacher with a special focus on providing safe spaces for the LBGTQIA plus community to practice mindfulness. Thank you both so much for joining us today for this important conversation. I will now turn it over to you to begin the presentation. Thank you so much. So um, I am going to share my screen um, and we're just gonna go over a slide deck um, and just give you a little bit of an overview of PFLAG, who we are, um, kind of what we're about, and then also talk about why um, the International Day of Transgender Visibility is so important. So um, let me get this queued up for you. We just love technology. Yes. <laughs> and Chris, by the way, is now vice president of PFLAG, yes. the new development. That is a change. So congratulations. <laughs> that is amazing. So, Thank so you. So grateful for her to step up to that. Thanks. Can you guys see everything, uh, the presentation that's up? Let's see, I cannot see a presentation at this time. Okay. Let me try that one more time then. All right, I think this should be, you should see my other screen now, and now this should be showing. Here we go. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, I see it. Okay, great. All right, so as I said, we just have a um, just some slides to go over um, for some education um, today. Um, the first thing that we just want to go over is just a little bit about PFLAG, so you know what our organization does and who we are. Um, kind of go over the history of Transgender Day of Visibility. Um, talk about facts um, regarding our transgender community, um, and then um, just recognize some notable transgender people in our community. So um, with that, Jaren, I will have you um, start. Thank you, Chris. So I'm Jaren Terry, and I am the proud to be the president of PFLAG Columbus. So just a little bit about PFLAG National. We are the oldest and the largest advocacy group for LGBTQ plus in the nation. And it was founded in 1973 by Jean Manford, who you see in the slide here with her son, Morty. So um, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary, actually this very month. And uh, Jean supported her son and they marched together in the very first Christopher Street Parade, which was the forerunner to the New York City Pride Parade. And the first meeting of PFLAG was held in March, 1973 at the um, church that's right in front of the Stonewall, uh, Stonewall Union in uh, New York City. Next slide. So PFLAG has a three-part mission. We um, 
our vision is to envision a world where diversity is celebrated and all people are respected, valued, and affirmed, inclusive of their sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. And our mission is to build on this foundation of loving families united with LGBTQIA plus people and allies who support one another and educate ourselves and communities to speak up as advocates until all hearts and minds respect, value, and affirm LGBTQIA people. We do this through leading with love. And um, I guess I already went over those, but as you can see, we have our new um, logo from National there with our Trans Lives Matter just for today. Well, every day actually Trans Lives Matter, but today is the Transgender Day of Visibility. And so PFLAG Columbus is just one chapter of PFLAG National, of which there are 350,000 members across the country and all work together to educate. PFLAG Columbus um, holds a Zoom meeting with a speaker on the third Sunday of every month. And um, we advocate, we go down to the state house when we're called upon to testify. We write letters to the editor. We, um, we basically agitate some folks by uh, speaking our minds every single day and call our legislators and all of that. We follow the lead of Equality Ohio on that. <clears throat> And we um, support through having a once a month in-person support meeting, which we hold up in uh, Worthington. So that's what we're about, Chris. Thank you. So just wanted to take a moment um, and talk about the history of International Transgender Day of Visibility. And then we'll talk about why it's important. And then um, just talk about some facts as it relates to gender, um, and orientation and things of that nature. So um, International Transgender Day of Visibility was founded by transgender activist, Rachel Crandall um, in Michigan in 2009. So she's a very prominent psychotherapist um, and had the idea to celebrate visibility in the trans community. Um, at, at the time she created this, um, the holiday that was recognized was Transgender Day of Remembrance, which is very important. Um, that's a day in November um, where we remember transgender people who have passed. Um, there are a lot of transgender people who are targeted by violence and lose their lives that way. There are a lot of transgender people that die by suicide. Um, you know, and then there are people who, who have passed, but um, she really wanted to have a day where, um, we celebrate the lives and contributions of transgender people, and then we raise awareness of discrimination faced by transgender people worldwide. So, um, so that's how it was founded. Um, the first um, International Transgender Day of Visibility was held on March 31st of 2009. And then Joe Biden officially proclaimed March 31st, 2021 um, as Transgender Day of Visibility in the United States. So that's just a little bit of a history there. And then thinking about why we celebrate, um, well, we celebrate because the joy, the resilience, and the accomplishments of transgender, non-binary, gender fluid people across the world deserve to be celebrated. Um, there are currently um, estimated over 1.4 million transgender youth and adults across the United States. So this was a statistic that was um, obtained by the Williams Institute at the UCLA School of Law by looking at census data and things of that nature. And we know that transgender people cut across all intersections of race, class, nationality, religion. So everywhere there is humanity, you will find transgender people. Um, and that's something that, you know, when I'm talking about this topic is very dear to me because it is part of the human experience. Transgender people exist literally in all walks of life, every corner of the world, um, you know, and at all intersections. So it's important to realize that and honor that. Um, and especially today, um, and I know, you know, I think it's really timely that we're talking about this because there's just unprecedented attacks, anti-transgender legislation pending in almost every state currently. 
Um, and transgender people are fighting for just basic human rights, the right to exist in public spaces, you know, the right to use the bathroom connected to their gender, the right to access housing, to access education that's equal, um, to be free of violence, attacks and threats. Um, and as the mother of somebody who's transgender, it hits me really hard, you know, to, to have seen my child experience some of those things firsthand. So um, that's why we celebrate and that's why we fight. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting to talk about is just generational change. Um, you know, the United States is historically just a very patriarchal society. So you have men and you have women, and that's your option. Those are your, that's your gender structure. You can be male you can be female. But we know that a lot of, um, you know, youth that are in Generation Z are increasingly breaking out of those dichotomous gender roles. So there's really a growing trend to recognize a wider spectrum of being along with more fluidity of gender. So, um, you know, just, just realizing that there is a range of a way of being, it's not this or this. Um, so a little less rigid in gender roles and looking at different ways to define themselves. So um, I know it's less current, but a 2019 Vice Voices survey revealed the following. So of all Gen Z people, 41% said they identified as more neutral on the gender spectrum. 55% really um, didn't feel that gender labels helped them to define themselves as a person. Um, and then 62% felt strongly that um, anyone should be able to use any label to identify with that they feel comfortable with. So I just put a link in there. Um, it's a really cool article um, just for some education about how things are changing um, and how the younger generations are, are opening up a bit more. So talking about transgender people, um, really it, it's important to understand sex and gender, and it's important to understand sexual orientation and kind of how that all fits together. So this is, um, you know, just a common resource that's utilized to kind of illustrate it. Um, there's also a gender unicorn if you guys are interested in looking at that, but um, I always start here with sex. So your sex is your biological sex that's determined by your organs, your hormones, your chromosomes, um, and how you're identified at the time of your birth. So, you know, your female has, you know, female reproductive organs, two XX chromosomes, male has male reproductive organs, XY chromosomes, and then there is also a third, which is intersex, and that's a combination of the two. So that's just very biological. And then we move into gender identity which is really how you, in your mind, in your head, think about yourself, okay? So it's really the chemistry that composes you. So, um, you know, how, how you interpret what that means in your body and in your mind. Um, and then gender expression is how you demonstrate your gender. And this is based on traditional gender roles, by the way. Um, so when we talk about that, we're talking about US-based gender roles because there is a larger range out there in the world. Um, so the way you act, dress, behave, and interact with others. Um, and being transgender is just, you know, you have a biological sex and the way you identify and your expression does not match that. Um, and that's it. Um, you know, and then there's also a range in there. So, you know, you can be, you know, non-binary, you can be gender fluid and kind of going back and forth. Um, and then sexual orientation is separate from that. So I know, um, you know, I get a lot of questions, you know, just, just about my child and, you know, transgender male. Well, why would you become a transgender male if you're not going to be interested in women? You know, it's, it's not connected to that. It is not the same thing. Um, your sexual orientation is really who you are physically, spiritually, and emotionally attracted to um, based on their sex, gender, and relation to your own. Um, and definitely with younger generations, we see less of a need to like label that, you know, we're very label centric in our society. So, um, and all so of just, these things are on a spectrum. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's not just this or this, and there's nothing in between. Um, and it it's, never has been, you know, not the binary, but the spectrum that's yes. Yeah. So this is one of my favorite things to talk about because I did study, um, anthropology in college. Um, 
is gender expression around the world? And this is just a tiny, I mean, as I could only fit this on this one slide. So I picked a couple examples, but um, definitely if you're interested in this topic, look into it because we recognize that there are transgender people all around the world from all cultures um, in all corners of the world. So an example of that, um, you know, one of the cultures that recognize, recognizes more genders um, are the Bugis people of Indonesia. They actually recognize five genders. Um, Indian culture widely recognizes a third gender um, called Idra, and that means neither male nor female. So something in between completely, neither man nor woman. Um, Native American cultures recognize um, two spirit, and that is somebody with both male and female characteristics. Um, and, and that's really interesting to research. A lot of um, younger generations are really trying to bring back that understanding of gender. Um, Samoan culture also has a third gender and a third sexuality. So something, um, you know, in between and also something in between with sexual orientation. Um, looking more towards like Western culture, um, I thought it was interesting that in Australia, um, the high court made a landmark decision recognizing a third neutral gender in 2014 that people can, yeah, people can utilize and, and you know, register themselves as. Um, Germany has done something similar. And then in the U.S., even though, you know, our society's um, really struggling with this right now, um, you know, the American Medical Association, you know, pediatric associations widely recognize that that there is a range of gender, um, that the transgender experience is valid and that it, it should be affirmed. Yes, yes. So why does it matter? I know we hear this a lot. Well, why does it matter? Pronouns, this and that, why, why do we care? Um, well, because transgender and non-binary people are part of the human experience. And if they're part of the human experience, they deserve basic human rights. They deserve the right to express themselves um, in congruence with how they feel. Um, and they are truly one of our most vulnerable populations. Um, and I, I actually, this shocked me knowing that there's this legislation, but when I went on this website, I was like, wow, it really, when you look at it at a large scale across the United States is shocking. Um, in 2023, like we have 490 bills pending across 47 states in the United States right now attacking trans individuals. And this ranges from access to health care, education, legal recognition, um, and just the right to publicly exist, the right to exist free from discrimination, free from harm, free from inappropriate inquiry about, you know, their existence. Um, and then 26 of these have been signed into law. I know we've seen, um, you know, and not just connected to transgender, but also, I mean, look at the laws that have been passing, you know, for example, in Tennessee, banning drag queen shows and drag king shows and things like that. Like, it's really it's crazy. Yes, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's cutting across a lot of things and is really impacting the LGBTQIA plus community negatively. So I just have my source there. Um, if any of you are interested in looking up and learning a little bit more about what's happening there across the US. And then um, I'm going to review this slide, but I do want to caution at first. Um, when we talk about mental health connected to transgender people, um, I want to make sure that, that I'm clear right off the bat that being transgender is not um, a mental illness. It is not um, caused by a mental illness. So I know I've seen a lot of rhetoric, you know, in the media and, and what have you that people are this way because they're mentally ill and that is not true. So that none of the literature cites that there are no um, research supporting that. Um, but I do wanna call to attention, you know, um, just with a recent survey um, by the Trevor Project, that fewer than one in three transgender and non-binary youth find their homes to be gender affirming. One in five transgender and non-binary youth have attempted or thought about suicide. Um, and we know that LGBTQ plus youth of color report higher rates than that than white peers. So you really need to think about how vulnerable people are at those intersections of you know, race, class, religion, things like that. That all has a massive impact um, on transgender people. 
Um, and we know that LGBTQ plus youth in affirming schools, families, and communities report significantly lower rates of mental health issues, attempting suicide than those who do not. So we do see literature that definitively states that, you know, providing a supporting, and I don't think this is shocking, you know, providing a, a society that supports and affirms a person's identity helps mental health and helps them thrive, um, that those things are good uh, for transgender people. Yeah. And then my, my um, I just want to cite everything that's down at the bottom if you want to check that out. Um, so this is Ohio only. I just want to call attention to some of the anti-trans legislation and actions that have either passed or are pending in the state of Ohio right now. So um, recently, and this was in December of 22, um, while they're not a legislative body, it's very significant for transgender youth in school. Um, the Ohio State School Board passed a resolution opposing the, the federal government's Title IX protections of LGBTQ plus students. So our federal government added protections to transgender and gender nonconforming students, mm -hmm. stating that they have the right to use the bathroom that can, you know, that they feel most comfortable using. They have the right to use the bathroom. They do. Um, <laughs> they have the right to... Um, you know, not be outed uh, before they're ready. So if, you know, a school hears of or comes to understand that a student is identifying this way, they, they respect that person's right to choose when and how they come out to their family and society. Right, right to choose when and how they come out to their family and society. Right, when and how they come out to their family and society. That's okay. <laughs> Sorry, I had a little echo there. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, and so that's created an environment where transgender and gender diverse students' identities become like an issue in the schools. They're not an issue, they're there. They deserve to be affirmed and respected and they deserve an equal education along with any other student. Um, so, so that's one thing that was concerning. House Bill 6 is currently pending. I'm not entertaining the names of these bills because I think they're very misleading. Um, but under the guise of protecting women in sports, this is a proposal to ban only trans women and girls from playing sports. So it does not include trans men, um, which just kind of shows the bias that we have in this situation. But it's a proposal to ban trans women and girls from playing sports. This is not just in elementary, junior high, high school, they are taking this to collegiate levels. Um, and just to show you the threat that transgender women are, there are only six recorded transgender females playing sports right now in the state of Ohio. So the thought that this is some mass threat, um, you know, is challenging at best. So um, just wanted to bring that, that is actively being um, considered in the house. Um, House Bill 8, if you read it, it's just very vague. It requires public schools to notify parents about a range of just weird identified circumstances targeting LGBTQ plus students. So this bill would actually contradict the federal protections in Title IX. And then this is the one that hits me in the gut. So we've got House Bill 68, um, and that is pending hearing. Um, and I believe they call this the save like save kids from experimentation bill. Um, this basically bans gender affirming care to anyone under age 18. Um, in addition to banning care, it prevents doctors from diagnosing or treating a minor with gender related condition or concerns without parental consent. It prohibits courts from considering a parent's refusal to accept gender and custody cases. And the most concerning to me is that it requires reporting of this data from mental health professionals on the number of patients treated, the demographic info of those patients. Um, and that's just terrifying. Um, if we've learned nothing from history, that reporting of private concerns is, is highly upsetting. So, um, and just understanding too, one of the things that I like to discuss is that gender affirming care has been supported by the American Medical Association, Pediatric Associations, Association of Pediatric Hospitals. This is evidence-based medicine. And we know that receiving gender-affirming care 
um, is the standard of care for transgender youth experiencing dysphoria, which is, you know, the feeling of that disconnect from your body and how you identify. Um, it is absolutely um, individualized. So the idea that, uh, you know, a youth is going to say I'm transgender and they get sent to surgery is not true. Um, there are so many different ranges of options from even just counseling with somebody who has the education in, you know, transgender LGBTQ issues is so important to, um, you know, yes, there can be hormones and things like puberty blockers that, that help these children kind of cope with the dysphoria, um, you know, and then it goes on down the road, but every journey is individual. And so the ability of a family to choose and for you know medical professionals to guide that care um, is critical for the transgender community. And Chris, I'd like to add that one of the things that um, the people who are pushing these bills, they are citing a group called the American College of Pediatricians. Yes. That group yes. is extremely small, was founded in 2012, right is identified as a hate group. It is yes. not to be com confused with the American Academy of Pediatrics founded yeah. more than a hundred years ago in 1930. And that is where most pediatricians fall in affirming transgender health care for children, which generally does not include um, surgery at all. Yeah, it's, um, and there's so, I mean, that points to just the level of kind of misinformation that is out there and the need to really check resources when ingesting this information, because there's a lot of tactics to kind of name things in a weird way to give them more credibility when they're not really credible sources. Um, and that's, that's something I think that's concerning just in our society as a whole. Um, but on a personal note, the thought of my child losing access to healthcare because it's not just about transgender care, it's access to healthcare. The thought about my child losing that, I mean, we, we'd have to leave the state. There's no, there's just no, we couldn't stay. Um, and so we're also losing, not only from our state, but from our country, a lot of amazing talent and resources um, and people that could be amazing contributors to society because they cannot live here, so. Um, so just transgender rights. So PFLAG um, absolutely supports and advocates for the rights of transgender people to access gender affirming health care. Um, that's a human right. To participate in sports. This is a human right. To use the bathroom of their choice. This is a human right as well. Um, to live free from harm and violence. Um, this is particularly critical for our black and brown transgender women who are inordinately impacted by violence against them. Um, to be free from discrimination in their society, work, and home. To be affirmed as a valid human being. And um, just for more information, I think the ACLU is doing a lot to try to help um, legally some of the families that are caught in the mire of all this legislation. Um, so there's a lot of great resources, you know, even if you and your family would need some assistance. Um, I've got a link here to ACLU and just transgender people and discrimination, um, some of the trends, how they can help if you find yourself in kind of a tight spot and some of your legal resources that you can use. And then just in the spirit of Transgender Day of Visibility, this is a day where we're supposed to celebrate transgender people because there is a rich history of transgender people contributing amazing things to our society. So my next couple of slides are just, um, you know, I'd like to use them to just recognize these people. Um, many of them you're going to recognize right away, but I mean, it's not exhaustive. I mean, there's, you can look it up. It's Right. There's many, many, but these are some that, that I thought just kind of were a diverse group. So um, we've got Sam Smith, who is a really well-known uh, British singer. Um, we've got Jazz Jennings, who um, has been kind of at the forefront since the age of seven um, and has shared her story very courageously of being a transgender child, transitioning and coming out. 
Um, we've got Dr. Rachel Levine, who is the first Assistant Secretary for Health and Human Services in the United States. So um, a lot of good work being done there. Um, Elliot Fletcher is an actor. Um, you can see him on shows like Shameless um, and a couple others. He plays um, a lot of young transgender characters, so does a lot of work providing visibility for transgender youth um, through media. Um, and then Laverne Cox, she is um, the first transgender person nominated for an Emmy Award for her work on Orange is the New Black. Um, you can catch her on a couple other series. And she's also just an amazing voice um, for transgender rights in the community. Um, Chaz Bono, um, we know he is um, Sonny and Cher's child. So Chaz has been very visible. Um, you know, in the LGBTQ community and supporting transgender rights. Um, and then Kai Shapley, um, Kai has identified as transgender from a very young age and has appeared in the Mama Bears documentary. Um, they have actually, their family unfortunately is from Texas and has had to flee the state of Texas. Um, she resides in Connecticut now, um, but she's just, if you hear her speak at the age of 11, I mean, she's just amazing. I mean, she goes, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna add that the Mama Bears documentary is, it was just announced yesterday, is going to air on PBS on June 20 on Independent Lens. And you'll see Kai in there where she, where she says, what about me? Looks like a boy. She's just a Yeah, dog. yeah, she's, a, <laughs> she's amazing. So if you have not, um, that's an amazing documentary. I wish we could make it like required viewing for everyone in our country. It's it's just a really important um, statement about the transgender experience in our country. Um, and then we have Elliot Page, who's also, um, you know, we've kind of watched him through his transition, um, kind of coming out in the media and in the public and in the spotlight and just being a really strong voice for transgender people. Um, the first woman at the upper left is Lynn Conway. So she is like, I couldn't even list all of her achievements. She's like this huge pioneer in the field of computer science and has, I mean, made things like AI possible. And so the list just goes on and on for her. I just thought it was um, really interesting. Yeah, smart cookie. <laughs> um, and then Patricio Manuel is an American professional boxer. So he is the first transgender male to be in a professional boxing match. So he's actually a professional fighter um, and just, just really cool to watch, um, particularly since, you know, just seeing the validity of transgender people in sports is so important. Um, Tilda Swinton, um, who's been in numerous, numerous movies, I'm sure you've seen her in one, um, does not identify as male or female. Um, and then we also have Kim Petras. Yeah, <laughs> Kim Petras, who did, uh, I think, um, a duet with Sam Smith, I believe, and caused a little controversy, but um, she's an amazing person. She um, is a German-born um, transgender singer, um, and her story is really cool um, if you'd want to learn more about that. So um, just a way to highlight some really amazing transgender people who have contributed incredible things to our society. So. Um, and then the last piece that we wanted to go over, just some resources. We are, we're here for anyone in the community. We, we meet people where you are. Um, you know, we're here for support. We're here for resources, education, advocacy. Um, so this is just where you can get in touch with us. So the national website's pflag.org and they have some really good um, just educational resources. They've got one called Our Trans Loved Ones. They have a guide for grandparents. I know I, I gave that to mine, my parents when my um, child came out. Um, and it was very helpful to just help kind of help them understand what is happening. And, um, and you can really download great... all those for free. Yes, you can just download them. They're amazing. Um, and then our local website's P Flag Columbus. We've got a lot going on. We've been busy. Um, but just a lot of variety we like to do is, you know, a good mix of like education, advocacy, and support. Um, and we've got our email here. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. So um, check us out, reach out. Um, 
if you reach out to us, there will be people that respond right away. So um, yeah, we're here for you guys. So, um, and Jaren, I don't know if you have anything else you wanted to add, but otherwise we can just kind of, you know, if there's any discussion or questions that anyone wants to ask, or we can, we can do that. I think too. you um, covered everything. Um, I think maybe the only thing we didn't talk about was that transgender is an umbrella term for uh, that can include people who are non-binary or identify as agender and um, or not. So it depends on each individual that being uh, transgender or non-binary is a very personal individual thing. And, and just because you uh, meet one person who's trans, you haven't met them all. Yeah, for sure. So we're ready for questions. Yes, thank you so much. This was a wonderful presentation with a lot of helpful information. The immediate question that I would have is as we move to really build supportive and inclusive communities and spaces, what can we do to intentionally become allies and offer support? Do you, do you want, want to take that? Yeah, we. I think we'll probably both speak on that. <laughs> okay, yeah, <we're> <laughs> so, um, you know, as uh, Chris talked about, everything is really on a spectrum. You know, people think you're either for it or against it. You're either male or female. You're either this or that. Everything is on a spectrum, including allyship. And so when we talk about uh, meeting people where they are and leading with love, that allyship is on a spectrum. So some people may come in totally uninformed and have preformed or prejudged prejudice about uh, who and what transgender people are. And we invite them to move along the spectrum to get to the point of being fully affirming. And so some of the ways to demonstrate allyship are to speak up, not in maybe a forum like this, although this certainly counts, but um, you know, when you're with your friends or family and you hear somebody crack a, what they call a joke about uh, the trans community, just you know, jump in. That's being an ally and say, you know, that's not really appropriate. And maybe that's all you need to say, or maybe there's more you can say that. So that's one example. Um, so I, I will say, if you're an ally, be visible. Be a, we need visible allies right now. Um, there are transgender families in crisis, queer families in crisis right now. I know I'm one of them. I mean, we, we've already been in a situation where we've had to move from one community where there was intense bullying, hatred, my kid was not doing well in school to another that is more affirming, but now we're facing all of this legislation in Ohio. So it's like, do we go to Canada? Where do we go? I mean, you feel like there's nowhere and the transgender community is small, which makes it critical for our allies to speak up, vote, get out there, know what this legislation is. I know, I mean, I was always cognizant of legislation, but you really, there's a lot of stuff going on that just learning about, being knowledgeable about, and then just think about, I feel like we're just in this massive culture war right now. And just because you don't understand dysphoria or what being transgender is does not mean that it's not valid. I don't understand a lot of other people's experiences, but I validate and affirm them. Right. Um, we need people to get out and vote. We need people to speak up when these bills are being introduced. Um, we need people to speak up when they see things like violence happening in our communities, which, which happens frequently, especially to those people experiencing like inter intersections of race and class and things like that. Um, and that's a lot. Um, but but I, I was yeah. just gonna add the one of the reasons it's so important and the Trevor Project research has shown this to be true, that if a child, a transgender or gender non-conforming child has just one adult in their life, their um, chance of self-harm goes way down and drops way down. Just, in, just so kids know there's somebody out there who cares. Thank you so very much. That is 
so important and I greatly appreciate you as well for sharing your lived experience. Um, thank you. So thank you very much for that authenticity and sharing because it is real and we need to raise awareness about it. So thank you. Um, we did receive an excellent question about um, those in the transgender community that may be justice involved. Um, would you happen to know, are jails and prisons, are they mandated to provide access to gender affirming care um, or gender reassignment treatment, including hormone therapy? And if not, are there uh, other advocacy that we can do in addition to those bills you highlighted that could possibly lead the way for that? So this, I actually, I almost put it in the slide and I should have now that I got that question, but yes, prisons are a place where transgender people are not being affirmed and not being seen and not being, you know, allowed to receive that care, that treatment. We have a lot of people in our prison system right now that, I mean, and that's a whole other topic I could, <laughs> but, um, but yes, it's absolutely impacted by this and the ability for people in the prison system to identify and to, to be put even in the right, you know, a, a women's prison, if you are a transgender woman or a, a male, you know what I mean? Those types of things are human rights issues. And yes, it absolutely negatively impacts transgender people that are incarcerated or in the prison system and, and facing those challenges too. So it's, it's literally in every kind of facet of our society that it has um, that impact. And just like a person who is imprisoned, who um, has diabetes, for example, they, they have a, a right to have access to their medication. So should transgender people who choose to take hormone replacement. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you could please highlight what, can we do to support someone that isn't ready to come out? Um, I think there are a lot of well-intentioned individuals that want to support, but like you mentioned earlier, we don't know how. And I believe that of course, patience being key, but what can we do additionally? So I think, um, and this is kind of hard, I, I, we need to provide more spaces that are authentically safe for people, I mean, you have people that are not going to come out in a society where they're going to be in danger, they're going to be denied basic human rights, um, or their families or, you know, places of worship are very anti-affirming. Um, so just taking a moment to understand this experience. And like, I always like, if there's one thing I can impart, it's that being transgender is part of the human experience. Like this is not just a, a small pocket of people in the United States that are, this is, has been across history, spaces of time, cultures. It's part of the human experience, like it or not, it is. And so how do we provide space for people to be their authentic selves and to not feel like we're threatened. I, I know like our society has been very like male, female, this, that, but we're not a threat. We're not, we're not hurting anybody. Like my child is a, my child's a straight A student, a cellist, a prolific baker. I mean, bakes cupcakes. So you can't, you know, and it really like we have to provide more authentically safe spaces. And that's why the legislation impacting schools is so critical. Sometimes a child's only safe space is at school. And I think any, I'm not an educator and bless the educators, but I think they, they will say that too. Sometimes that is a safe space for a child during a day. That's where they can go to, to be, to receive equal education and receive affirmation. And if that's taken away, you know, you just have, a group of people that are just absolutely vulnerable, you know, and we've, and, we've got and, to move past that. And I'd like to speak to the uh, business um, environment, jobs, et cetera. Um, oh, yeah. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm the mother of an adult non-binary person who has just had tremendous success in their career. I mean, they're just fabulous, fun person in general. But one of the things that has uh, made life um good for the for my child is the fact that they work for a company that recognizes that LGBTQ plus people across the spectrum have a right to exist 
and have a right to a, a good work environment where they're respected as part of the um, organization. And one of the things that um, companies can do, and this goes to the HR department, which of course is um, under the umbrella of the CEO and the board and all of that, is make sure that um, people are comfortable with their pronouns. Pronoun use is so important, not just um, he and she, depending on you know whether the person identifies and expresses themselves as male or female, but also they as a singular pronoun for people who are non-binary or gender non-conforming to actually make sure that's on their um, company intake form so that people can self-identify there. And also the, to make sure that they have created an environment in the business, um, the business environment where it's made clear that people will be respected and um, called by the pronouns they choose, et cetera. So there's a lot to be said for uh, the work environment for adults too. But one thing that's really important is that we never out anyone else. People can out themselves, but that is up to them totally. So if you feel like you have a coworker that you think you think might be a member of the LGBTQ plus community or trans or you know whatever, that is not up to you to ask them about it or to speculate with your coworkers, but to um, just make it clear through your actions and words that this is a safe environment. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's wonderful. And I'm so appreciative of you highlighting that. Um, definitely something to keep in mind. Um, I would also, if I could ask, um, you spoke of those in mental health crisis, and we know that is just um, is such a widespread issue. And we we would love to take the time to highlight if you know of any supports that are in place for those in crisis. Um, local in the community, uh, PFLAG, Columbus organizations, could you please speak a little on what can be done in those times of crisis? Mm -hmm. So um, our, our brochure, we've got a whole <laughs> list of organizations here locally. Of course, um, NetCare access is um, for people who are in serious crisis. If you think someone is um, about to take their own life, you need to get them to an emergency room. But before that, um, you, you can access uh, Stonewall Columbus has a list of organizations such as Centero, who we've had um, speak to speak at our meetings frequently, S-Y-N-T-E-R-O. So, you know, when someone says, well, just go for counseling, it's really important that you're going to a counselor who is not only an affirming person, but also someone who's educated. One thing you don't want to do is go somewhere where they're going to say, oh, well, we provide conversion therapy because all of the major medical uh, organizations have shown that that is very harmful and really has been outlawed in many um, areas and, and should be altogether done away with. But we also have um, Equitas Health locally can uh, send folks for counseling for uh, children and young people, we have Thrive at Nationwide Children's Hospital. And we also have a Kaleidoscope Youth Center, which um, serves teens and I think up through age 23, I probably shouldn't be quoting things I'm not sure, but I know they don't kick them out when they turn 18 or 21. So um, that's what we have locally. Trans Ohio is here um, for the whole state, but there's definitely um, a lot of organizations that are, are standing by to help. And of course, PFLAG Columbus. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you so much. We will also be sure um, we provide those links so that individuals have access to that. Thank you very much. Um, I did want to touch on one thing because it resonated a tad bit with me. When you began, you talked about being advocates and leading through love. And I would just love to know more about that. And is there a difference when we speak of advocacy versus allyship? Yes. Chris, do you want me to take that? 
Sure. And I can add to you. I'm sure we're both probably like, <laughs> I know we've got, maybe we can do it in tandem. Yeah. <laughs> so what we mean by um, we P flag leads with love is that, um, you know, on a personal level, when someone comes to me and, and says, oh, I don't want my kid to be gay or, oh, my child um, says they're, you know, a boy or a girl and we need to fix that and change that. I mean, on a personal level, I I just want to shout them down and, and, you know, get them to fly right and all of that stuff. However, PFLAG leading with love means we meet them where they are. And it's like, we understand that this is a very frightening thing for parents when young kids come out to them and they don't know where to turn. And we want to be sure that, that we sit down with them and, and validate that these feelings are very real. And um, because, you know, when the newborn baby is put in your arms, a lot of people, they immediately have a whole script of, um, you know, what that child's life is going to be like all the way up to their wedding and the grandchildren they'll produce and all of that. And I am here to tell you that just because you have, you don't have to change the script, all you do is recast the characters and have that same happy ending. So we meet people where they are and, and help them understand how they can move along to being affirming. And so Chris, maybe you can talk about the difference between allyship and um, being an advocate. So, um, I don't think those things have to be completely separate, um, but I see advocacy as being somebody who, in advocating for the community, is showing up to spaces where legislation is pending, um, you know, maybe showing up to some of the marches and demonstrations, um, you know, supporting and standing by trans people as they're going through things like legal proceedings for, you know, just things that they're finding, situations that they're finding themselves in because of their identity. Um, you know, companies that are advocating for the rights and trying to kind of push back against this whole weird culture war that we're in. Um, and allyship are people that affirm and respect transgender lives. And so I think those things can, I don't, I don't, I think that's kind of I think those things weave together a lot. And, you know, if you're an advocate, I think you're an ally. You don't necessarily have to be a big advocate to be an ally, but, um, you know, I think the more people learn and the more people educate themselves. And, and if you can have empathy for another human being, I think um, you can find yourself in both of those spaces, but, um, you know, ally- on a spectrum too. Right. But some people like come in with a paper bag over their head. Oh, I'm an ally, but I'm not. Yeah. Say anything. Right. And other people are standing up at the state house. Right. The other thing about um, allyship or advocacy or, um, you know, actually being in the fight with somebody that that we hear is, well, if you're not standing close enough to be hit by the same stones that are being thrown at these people, that's not good enough. It's, it's true. You know what? And today really there is an opportunity to stand close. It's at 5 p.m. at Goodell Park yep. today. And I kind of hesitate saying that out loud on Facebook because we don't, Lord knows we don't need the unaffirming people to show up. Yeah. But the more that do, the better. And Thank I think, you. go like, ahead. Lead, no, I think just one piece on the leading with love is like, to me, coming from a space of, just coming from a space of love, I, we have a lot, and we see them on our Facebook page, and I, I think, you know, trolls and whatever, people just trying to create hate and just get you riled up. I'm not meeting that at the level you're coming at me at. We're not going to meet you there. We're not going to that level. Um, and that's, that's really hard. <laughs> but um, But I think there's a big piece of leading with love there. I think when we act from a space of love, we're elevating ourselves above that hatred, that bottom rhetoric that's meant to segregate people, that's meant to make others, that's meant to, you know, marginalize people. Um, and when you're down in that space, it's not just transgender people, there's connections and, and it's usually 
a whole network of just, you know, marginalized people that are impacted by that space. And so just trying to work to elevate that and provide resources, spaces for people to come together and, and work through this together, I think is a big part of it. It's hard. <laughs> yes, most definitely. And thank you so much for saying that. Thank you. This has been an amazing conversation. And I just really want to thank you both so much for joining us and for providing uh, the data, the information, and the support on this very special and important day. Uh, I definitely want to thank the Board of Commissioners uh, for their ongoing support, our County Administrator, Kenneth Wilson, and definitely thank everyone that has joined us today to hear this important conversation. So I want to say to everyone, thank you, take care, and please join us in the future for our additional Lunch and Learns as we highlight our wonderful inclusive days. Thank you. Thank you so, thank so, you much. so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care.